I don't see the poster any longer, do you? Bhavni, perhaps you can um, let me know when to start, but we'll certainly wait until uh, most people have joined. Okay, I'm told I can start, but I think I would start like now. to... Um, I think it may be a good idea to wait until everyone's joined because we only have uh, 19 people and the number is going up. So I think I'll wait and let uh, everyone join. This joining process is very slow. I think maybe we can begin because uh, people will keep joining in. It takes a bit of time for them to join in and it is streaming live now on YouTube. Yes, it is actually very slow, but um, yes, you're probably right. I mean, it's only just three minutes past 10, so maybe we can give another one or two minutes. It's exceptionally slow. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, as uh, more people join, I think we should uh, start. So um, good morning if you are in the UK and good afternoon if you're in India. And good evening to our speaker, uh, Professor Sanjay Srivastav, who's in Australia at present and has very kindly agreed to join us at this uh, very late hour for him. So I'm Nandini Guptu and I chair the INDOX Strategy Board and I teach at the Oxford Department of International Development. I'm delighted to welcome all of you, and especially, of course, Professor uh, Srivastav, to this webinar of the India Oxford Initiative. Before we move on to the main event, uh, that is Professor Srivastav's talk, I would like to take a minute to say a few words about INDOX for those of us who are joining us for the first time, those of you who are joining us for the first time. So INDOX is a cross-divisional research platform for all researchers and academics at Oxford working in and on India. INDOX has two main aims, both of equal importance. One is to promote multidisciplinary research on India and collaboration among researchers across all our academic divisions within the university. The other is to develop research and impact partnerships between us at Oxford and academics, organizations and institutions in India. In these endeavors, we are particularly keen to support early career researchers and students. Each INDOX a webinar is organized by one of our divisions. Today is the social sciences webinar. The event is co-sponsored by several of our constituent units and also some colleges, including my own department, um, the political world's research cluster at the School of Geography, the contemporary South Asian studies program at uh, the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies, the South Asia Cluster at Wolfson College, the Oxford India Centre for Sustainable Development at Somerville College, and the Asian Studies Centre at St. Anthony's College. 
I'm grateful to all our colleagues for their support for this event. Uh, we shall be recording this event and it will be made available afterwards uh, through Indox's YouTube channel. Um, and it should be accessible via the Indox uh, website. Uh, before we uh, invite uh, our speaker to present his paper, please allow me to mention just one more point. This is about the Q&A part of our proceedings today. We would like you to type your answer uh, questions for the speaker in the Q&A box, please, not the chat box, because it's very difficult to uh, monitor both. So please, your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, please type your query in the chat box. Um, for uh, uh, our administrators to uh, help you out if there is an issue. And please, of course, uh, mute your uh, mics. Uh, without further ado, I will now hand over to my colleague, Nanika Mathur, who is Associate Professor in the Anthropology of South Asia. And Nanika will introduce our speaker um, now. So over to you, Nanika. Okay, thank you so much, Nandini. Um, and hi, welcome everyone. So it's my really great pleasure to introduce Professor Sanjay Srivastav. Um, Sanjay Srivastav is Professor of Sociology at the Institute of Economic Growth in Delhi. Um, he's also currently the British Academy Global Professor at the Department of Geography at uh, University College London. Um, so Sanjay has several, many books to his name um, and several publications. I'm gonna just list a few of them here in this introductory, um, you know, two seconds. Um, this include the books Constructing Post-Colonial India, National Character in the Dune School, which came out in 1998. He's also written Passionate Modernity, Sexuality, Class and Consumption in India, which came out in 2007. Sexuality Studies, which came out in 2013, and I believe most recently Entangled Urbanism, that came out in 2015. Uh, Sanjay is also the co-editor of Critical Themes in Indian Sociology and of Histories of Desire, Sexualities and Culture in Modern India. Now, Professor Shivastav's work uh, goes uh, beyond academic writing to several creative works, which include the documentary <laughs> film Kotla Walks, Performing Locality, uh, which was funded by the Japan Foundation, and a collaboration with the ethnographic filmmaker David McDougall in the making of a film based around his research on schooling, which is called Dune School Chronicles. Um, so uh, without further ado, over to Professor Shivastav. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nanika. Thank you, Nandini, uh, Premji, and Navni, and, uh, and for the organizers in general for inviting me. So let me start without any further delays, which we don't really have much time. Okay. So in this talk, and I'll read it out just to stick to time. So in this talk, I'm interested in thinking about the ways in which new forms of urbanism are the grounds for meanings regarding religious identity, class relationships between the uh, class relationships uh, a, a relationship between the state and private capital, the nature of the state itself, and ideas of the ordinary citizen, and ideas of public and private, uh, public space and private space. My focus is on the privately developed DLF city in, uh, in the district of Gurgaon in Haryana. And I will begin with three vignettes. Let me just begin with my first vignette. The first vignette is called Sitting Down to Prayer. <clears throat> On April 20, 2018, and many of you probably know this from news, a large number of Muslims were offering namaz in a vacant plot of land in the village of Wazirabad in Gurgaon district. Namaz, uh, in, sorry, can I go to number one? Slide one, please. Just to, just to give you a sense. So the cross is where Delhi is, and of course the little white arrow is where Gurgaon, the new Gurgaon is. So in, on April 20, 2018, a large number of Muslims were offered namaz in the vacant plot of land in the village of Wazirabad in Gurgaon district. Namaz in open spaces has been a common affair in many parts of Gurgaon. The prayers were disrupted by members of a group known as the Sayyuk Hindu Sangash Samiti. Soon after, the police registered a case against six men belonging to the Samiti. Uh, the following week, the Samiti organized a protest against the police and also delivered a letter to the Chief Minister of Haryana, demanding that Namaz and public land must be banned as these were nothing but pretexts to illegally occupy these lands and convert them into Muslim places of worship. Later on May 4, when another group of worshippers gathered for namaz at a space near Sahara Mall, can I have the next, next slide please? Uh, which is one of the malls in Gurgaon. Uh, next slide please. Uh, they were confronted by significant police presence. There's an open space around various buildings where namaz happens in Gurgaon. 
Subsequently, the Haryana Chief Minister released a statement in which he said, he said, I believe that namaz should indeed be offered, but in mosques at Eidgah and other designated places. Vignette two, men, it's called men marching through cities. Uh, figure three, next, next figure, please. Next page. From July to August, as many of you know, many parts of North India are witness to the Kamaria pilgrimage activity that relates to the worship of the god Shiva. Uh, uh, the pilgrims collect water from the river Ganges and bring it back to the local temples and offer it at the Shiva temple. The water is carried in containers that are slung on shoulder contraptions, which you can see here, which is that are known as kamas. Uh, from being a relatively small scale affair, over the past decade or so, the pilgrimage has grown to has grown to one that involves self, several million participants. And originally it was men, and next slide please, now lots of women also take part. Tented, uh, over the years, tented encampments have come to be set up along the various pilgrimage routes. These serve as night shelters and offer food, sleeping, and toilet facilities. The next figure, next, next slide please. The camps are sponsored by a variety of bodies, such as market traders, organizations, village groups, because many of the routes are along these urban villages, uh, urban residents, welfare associations, and private businesses. They're also sponsored by caste specific organizations, including Dalit groups. And some of the groups that we've been working with, with actually Dalit groups that have organized these various camps. The camps, or shivers as they're known, are usually on public land, and there is state support in building, say, the boundary walls, hiding tents, and regular spraying of disinfectants. Can I have the next one, please? Next slide. So now these two camps I've just shown you, these two slides, um, have been running for about 15 years. The second one, uh, this one, uh, was guarded by, border, by personnel from the border security force, as well as police personnel, as uh, one of the organizers I just told us, there were rumors of a terror threat. The police play a significant role in the organization of pilgrimage activity. Can I have the next slide, please? Including create, creating safe passageways for pilgrims, uh, so you have to register and get permission from district administration the police. Next slide. Uh, including safe, creating safe passageway for pilgrims and directing traffic around the pilgrim routes. The next slide, please. So I'll just leave you with these images and I'll go to my third vignette. The third vignette is called Lord Krishna's Birthday at Birmingham Gardens, Gurgaon. My final vignette comes from the prominent gated community that I'm calling here Birmingham Gardens. Uh, in DLF City. The Residents Welfare Association at Birmingham Gardens organizes a wide variety of community events of which celebrations of Diwali, Holi, Christmas, and various consumer goods fairs, next slide, are the most prominent, uh, are the most prominent. Different kinds, this is one consumer goods fair, and there are several of these that happen all the time in various gated communities. Uh, different kinds of worlds, religious, regional, national, transnational, lie within the gates of Birmingham Gardens and many other such gated communities. And much to me, the festival that celebrates the birth of God Krishna is a particularly prominent annual event at Birmingham Gardens. Since 2008, it has been organized by the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, some of whose members live within Birmingham, Garden, Birmingham Gardens and convinced the RA, RWA, Resident Welfare Association, to hand over the organization of the event to ISKCON. The celebrations that I'm going to describe to you begin with a bhajan uh, by a group of ISKCON devotees who sit on a large state, stage that faces several rows of chairs. Next, next slide, please. A powerful sound system ensures that the singing reaches all part of the complex. To the right of the stage, there's a large screen and a laptop and video projector used to project swirling color images onto the screen. A group of women begin to dance in an empty space in front of the, in front of the stage. Next slide, please. These are women primarily from the ISKCON families that live within the, comp live within the complex. This is an imp improvised performance that allows that follows ISKCON's street dance pattern seen in many Western cities. The cinema screen displays graphics of flying sword machines, flaming arrows, a twirling globe, and a variety of psychedelic animation. The ceremony builds to a crescendo. It concludes with an arti, a lamp ceremony, and the cutting of what is referred to as the Krishna birthday cake, which is then offered as prasad, as sanctified food. The screen now shows scenes from cities in the United States where American bhakts, devotees, dance, sing, and speak about their lives as Krishna bhakts, as Krishna devotees. 
the ceremony, which lasts some three hours, brings together then the Birmingham Garden Space, Birmingham Garden Space in Gurgaon, with an American one. The West is here, is in Birmingham, Birmingham Gardens, by a confident worldliness. Especially, especially notable is that this situation is unmarked by any, any anxiety or angst regarding cultural imperialism or India's colonial legacy. The, uh, the, uh, the, the West is here just as another world. We eat our cake and disperse. Let me now just go on to a very some gloss on what I presented to you in some attempt at analyzing the material that I presented to you in a very brief manner. The first section is called subaltern class formations. Let me begin with the Naza, uh, Namaz controversy referred to above. From the 1980s onwards, as Gurdwana began to attract private investment that established a variety of manufacturing, commercial, and service industries, it also attracted a significant migrant labor force uh, from different parts of the country. And in addition to white collar professionals, a very larger, in fact, a larger number of migrant labor is semi or unskilled, including those working in factories, shops, and as street vendors. Of this, a significant proportion is Muslim. Gurgaon's Muslim population is estimated to be around 300,000 right now after the influx of the migrant labor. There is a tiny and almost invisible Muslim middle class that lives in the locality. Gurgaon, the district, has 22 mosques including one whose construction remains an incomplete due to a legal dispute. Of these 22 mosques, 10 are considered legal by the government, recognized by the government. Of the 10 official mosques, eight are in older parts of Gurgaon or in or near villages that are far away for, from where most of the new Muslim population, factory labor, for example, works and lives. In December 2018, the Municipal Corporation of Gurgaon sealed, as it put it, and an under construction mosque declaring it illegal as it was within 300 meters radius of an Air Force ammunition depot. This mosque lies in the area that has significant population of working class Muslims. During the Namaz controversy of 2018, two specific reasons were offered for why A, Muslims should not pray in public spaces and B, the, why the mosque near defense establishment needed to be demolished. Firstly, it was said public lands should not be misused and that private activity upon them, such as worship, should not form the pretext for their apparent eventual conversion from public to private property. And secondly, it was said, certain places functioning as mosques had flouted existing rules regarding construction on land that was a certain distance from defense-linked establishments such as the Air Force uh, uh, Depot in Burgaon. It is, important to it is important to remember here that the language of the bans and the ceiling was entirely that of efficient administration and not, for example, as in the case of the Ayodhya dispute in a language of religion. Efficient urban administration befitting a modern city, it was suggested, required application of rules and regulations that reinforced ideas of the public and the private, both in oh, terms yeah. of spaces and behaviors. While Gurgaon's Muslim, while Gurgaon's Muslim population prays in the open because of insufficient number of mosques to accommodate the roughly 100,000 that offer namaz every week, there is another significant reason that has to do with the political economy of the city. At least two kabre ka to be. That has to do with the. That has to do with the political economy of the. Sorry, Sanjay. Cities. Sanjay. Um, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, there's some. Uh, there's something else showing under your name which seems to be giving a sound feedback. Thanks. Yes, that was. Uh, we couldn't. Uh, we could hear other things. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, so efficient administration befitting a modern city, it was suggested, required application of rules and regulations that reinforced ideas of the public and the private, both in terms of space and behavior. But Gurgaon's Muslim population pays in the open because of insufficient number of mosques to accommodate the roughly 100,000 people that open the mosques every week. There is another significant reason that has to do with the political economy of the new city itself. That's, that's, that's okay, so someone else is logged in, so. Um, this, uh, uh, this, this concerns the nature of work and nature of time in within Gurgaon and takes us in turn to the heart of class in the new city. Most Muslim workers in Gurgaon are employed in commercial industrial concerns owned by Hindus. They live and work in urban areas where there are just two official mosques, the rest being in far off villages, as I've mentioned. 
A trip to any of the latter would mean taking leave during working hours for anything up to two to three hours. As one Muslim worker pointed out, he said, which employer would allow his employees to take a three hour break in the Friday namaz? Within a system of work and labor dictated by temporalities of industrial and commercial production and governed by non-Muslims, the most feasible way to pray is to find spaces as near to places of work as possible. However, exhortations to pray in private and not build a mosque near prohibited government facilities are entirely in the language of administrative rationality regarding urban governance by formal and impersonal administrative procedures. The, the religious relations of production that have produced urbanism in Gurgaon are faced through such language. The key effect of this is to press official regulatory mechanisms in the service of making of what I'm calling peertopias, that is an urban landscape that naturalizes certain forms of religious practice as normal and other as abnormal. Uh, as abnormal. The making of subaltern Hindu and Muslim class identities, which I want, what I want to discuss in this section, is connected to this. As my Kavaria example shows, the state has been actively involved in organizing, in, in the organization of worship for Hindu communities. Official concerns over the use of public lands by Muslims helps to produce a very specific narrative regarding the different nature of class in subaltern Hindu and Muslim context. The Kamaria pilgrims, also mostly from poor backgrounds, are of the same socioeconomic background as most of the Muslim Namazis. However, notwithstanding the fact that large scale Kamaria ca uh, camps drop up every year with official permission on public lands, without, with official permission on public lands, there is no social or legal censure. Hindu subalternity is produced as quite distinct from the Muslim one, which is where here religion and class crosses over. So, whereas the former Hindu subalternity, is seen as capable of producing ordered and delimited religiosity in urban public environments, and the Muslim subalternity becomes characterized as essentially anti-urban and prone to subverting the nature of the urban itself to making claims, to making illegal claims upon its public spaces. Let me now move on to the next section, which is called elite class formations. So let me now address the issue of elite class formations. Ashraf Hussain, name change lives in a gated community in Gurgaon, where he's the chief executive of a Gurgaon-based company that deals in serviced apartments. In the wake of the mass controversy, Hussain, given his middle-class background, became actively involved in, in negotiations with a variety of district officials on behalf of Gurgaon's Muslim population. His group approached senior police officials and district officials to both secure appropriate venues for offering, offering prayer and protection from future disruptions and violence. Hussein was informed by the, by the various officials that the government court had valid concerns regarding designated green belts and public spaces being used for namaz. Hussein's group was then asked to, to draw up a map of all the public areas that were, that were being used for namaz. It identified, identified 85 such places. The district officials asked for a reduction in their number. The group reluctantly agreed to 50, but they were told that no more than six, no more than six would be allowed. Eventually, 25, the administration agreed to 25. In addition to the official objections regarding private use of public land, one of the most persistent arguments put forward by the senior officials of the district was that like Hindus, Muslims should also find a way of praying, or praying in private in, in, the, in the confines of their homes. The most significant form of namaz, of namaz significant forms of namaz, as Hussain pointed out, in court require collective prayer and cannot be done in private, in private or individually. These include, he continued, those of Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, Adha, and Juma Namaz. In, the it is in this instance, then, the language of administrative rationality about the proper use of public space and the impact of Muslim prayer upon urban ecology reproduces a religious argument through a narrative of a rational administrative. The idea of the publicness, of, of, of the publicness the idea of publicness that should be characteristic of a diverse urban sphere emerges then in this manner from, from a very specific religious worldview that in fact defines it. As mentioned above, due to a legal dispute, one of the official mosques has been in a state of semi-completion for a long time. This, uh, the land for this mosque was in fact allocated by the state-run Haryana Urban Development Corporation, Uda, to the local Waqf board, which looks after religious uh, buildings. Soon after construction of the mosque began, however, one of India's largest real estate companies um, uh, that has major projects in Gurgaon, 
filed a case stated, stating that a mosque ought not be constructed in a residential area, in its residential area, in effect. This brings us to a significant aspect regarding class and its non-subaltern dimensions within new urbanism in Gurgaon. Given the largely private nature of urban developments in Gurgaon since the 1980s, real estate behemoths such as Ansels and DLF have had considerable say in city planning. The state's administrative activities and the interests of private capital, in this case real estate companies, frequently overlap. The subtext of the court case initiated by this real estate company is that the company believes that the value of its properties and future sales will be adversely affected because of a mosque in its area, as it were. Most of its clientele is Hindu, and it believes that a mosque, unlike the Iskon Ranj and Mashtami celebrations at Birmingham Gardens, would make the area unattractive, an, an, an unattractive proposition for its buyers. Hence, even though the land has been officially allocated by the state, the state itself appears unwilling to enforce its own writ to confronting the company and its elite Hindu buyers. This too reinforces the ongoing process of making of the making of Hindu theotopias within New Gurgaon. During one of our meetings, Ashraf Hussain noted that for the past nine years, he's been organizing Ramaz during Ramadan within the compound to one of his service apartment um, complexes. Over, over 10 days, he told me, three chapters, of, uh, three chapters each of the Quran would be read. And many people can't afford the time when just one chapter is read every day to complete the whole namaz. This was, he said, a way in which the work pattern of Muslim professionals was able to be accommodated with the demands of proper worship. However, he continued, even though this was a personal space, I frequently saw, and I once saw, in fact, a police constable standing outside the property and talking to one of the superiors. The constable was saying on the phone, a number of Muslims have gathered here, and as the elections are coming, so I thought I should repeat, I should report this. It is important to contrast this with the Janmashtami episode at Birmingham that I've just, at Birmingham Gardens I've just discussed. Janmashtami celebrations at Birmingham Gardens signify the making of an urban context of religious cosmopolitanism. The celebrations link the space of this specific gated community to the various worlds of global Hinduism and mark its incorporation into certain aspects of North American spiritual life. This combines particularly well, I think, with notions of new Indian urbanism and the religiosity appropriate to this new Indian urbanism. This form of urban religiosity is neither the subject of an administrative gaze, nor is it a matter of cultural surveillance. Rather, it speaks through both official and unofficial articulations of the nature of new urbanism, city planning, the relationship between public and private spaces, and the identity of those who uphold the proper distinction between private and public activity. The next section is called the people in inverted commas and the eligibility of the state. The state, is, it is frequently suggested, must express its stateness and be eligible to a variety of formal public acts. What I want to suggest to you here, uh, rather, uh, is that in the present case, it is the eligibility of the eligibility of the state that is fundamental to both its presence and authority. It is important to focus upon those ways where the state leaves no clear trace regarding its relationship to the people in inverted commas. And that this allows us to understand the ways in which it relates differently to different sections of the population. Its eligibility allows for the creation and institutionalization of a personalized of a personalized rather than a formal state. Ashraf Hussain frequently told me that one of the most frustrating aspects of dealing with government officials was the impossibility of obtaining any legal or official documents that could be used to secure a regular place of worship or when required to refer to decisions regarding the allocation of space. So while there were frequent orders from senior police and district officials to reduce the number of places that were to be used for public namaz, none of them were ever issued in written form. Everything Hussain said and I quote, is oral. So when at different times we approached the police and said that we had started prayers at an agreed place and now we were being obstructed by some locals, the police would say, we may have given you permission at that point to, at that point to use such and such space, but it was never in writing, in the quote. The coming together of the state and religious practice in the context of new urbanism in Gurgaon is then significantly mediated through practices of illegibility. Indeed, the broadly understood notion of religious beliefs as affect allows for remolding of urban governmentality itself as an untraceable affect. The state itself becomes, an aff becomes affective and beyond formal ex uh, expression. However, and this is important to note, 
the state can choose to do its business through either legible administrative means, orders regarding how public space ought to be utilized, or eligibility through not providing any formal communication. This serves, I want to suggest to you, to define different kinds of peoples and publics, those with whom formal communication is warranted and those whose concerns are addressed, are to be addressed informally. Neo-urbanism is also then, through the register of religion, the practice of producing formal and informal people. So let me conclude that public, private, and the people. In my conclusion, what I want to suggest to you is the ideas of private and public in Gurgaon are fundamentally connected to changing ideas of the people and the ordinary person. The making of the new ordinary person has been a significant aspect of urban developments in India over the past few decades. So for example, middle-class residence welfare associations frequently invoke ideas of civil disobedience, a tagara and evolution that serve to consolidate the notion of an ordinary people fighting for their rights. This is particularly true of residence welfare association in cities uh, when they agitated against say a rising power tariff. This version of ordinariness contrasts, uh, contrasts strongly with that in the heyday of the developmentalist state or the Nairobian state, if you like, the five-year plan state, where it concerned, uh, concerned urban and rural poor of all backgrounds. At the current time, however, the category of the ordinary person is being redefined, whereby an apparently harried and taken for granted middle class comes to be represented as the common class, a representative of the armed army, if you like. In turn, the remaking of ordinariness in a time of consumerist modernity has specific consequences. It unfolds through it unfolds through differentiating the good consumer from the bad consumer. In turn, identifying the good ordinary citizen from his or her antithesis. The idea of the new ordinary citizen also plays a role in molding public debates and perceptions of religiosity. The ordinary person is the one with an acceptable religiosity which aligns with the norms of civic urbanity, the most significant of which is the, is the private public distinction. I will, and I will end with another example regarding the relationship between the new ordinary person and ideas of publicness. Of late, the street has emerged as a very significant site of assertions of middle class identity in Gurgaon. From being a space that historically, in the Indian context at least, historically, um, that was marked by chaos in the lower classes, uh, in inverted commas, it has increasingly become one where multiple dramas of middle class, middle classes are played out in Gurgaon. The event known as Rahagiri is a case in point. Yeah, the next slide, please. Based on a similar open street event that are held around the world, the first Rahagiri event was held in 2013 in Gurgaon. Um, it, it is promoted, uh, promoted as a citizen's initiative to take back the streets and emerged through a collaboration between two local NGOs, one involved in um, environmental issues and the other working with the poor, a bicycle riding group, a leisure by, uh, for leisure, a company that provides corporate wellness programs and a global consultancy companies, company that focuses on sustainable cities. The Gurgaon City Administration is also involved. Every Sunday, a stretch of, stretches of road streets are cordoned off to allow for a variety of activities. Children, men and women from different residential localities in DLF City take part in riding bicycles, yoga classes, aerobics, pilates, zumba and skateboarding amongst mm -hmm. others. The activities are mostly sponsored by companies such as Nike, Lotto, Adidas, as well as ma major media corporations. Um, uh, in addition, however, in addition to the uh, dealer residents who take part in these activities, there's another group of bodies that also frequents this particular Agri event. Can I have the next slide, please? So there's another set of bodies that's also present at Agri as an audience. This set of bodies lines the footpaths along the streets of activity. This crowd that watches consists of domestic workers, rickshaw pullers, private security guards, and a variety of people who otherwise sell peanuts or make a living from other informal business. This is the crowd of the street which now stands on footpath. Ragiri, I want to suggest to you, is one of the several ways in which the idea of ordinariness is being remade through a new association of the street with middle classes. The appropriation, of, the appropriation of the street cleansed of social and material filth through private sponsorship is part of a middle class statement regarding the, uh, re, regarding the, 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 the nature of the public the, uh, that belongs in public space, regarding the required nature of the public that belongs in these public spaces. As in the case of religion and ordinariness, 
the raggedy ordinariness also take place through a joint effort between private capital and the state. The street is an ordinary place for a new ordinary person. So older forms of urban modernity in India were primarily produced through relationships through relationship between different forms of state-led activities. So if you think of the steel cities, which came up in the 1950s, right? Um, contemporary manifestations of urbanization have dramatically a different form and a changed relationship between the state, private capital, and middle-class citizens. Through, the, through, the, through, through, this, through these changing relationships then, it is the middle-class Hindu citizen that is increasingly identified as the ordinary person who it is, who it is just as frequently suggested has been forced to bear an unfair burden of the consequences of the state's historic appeasement of the poor and religious minorities. It is this citizen who is seen as having the capacity to produce a new ordinary public culture that is appropriate to contemporary urban modernity. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sanjay. That was uh, a really incredibly uh, interesting and raises a whole range of questions. Um, so. Um, I would like to invite the audience to uh, type your uh, questions in the Q&A box, please. Let me see if there's anything there. And Sanjay, you should also be able to see the Q&A box. Uh, currently, there's nothing there. Please do type. But while people are collecting their thoughts and uh, uh, typing um, swiftly, um, can I maybe just ask with a, um, um, a question that's uh, probably historian's question? So some of the things that you were saying are reminiscent of the kind of uh, developments that I had noticed in my um, uh, research in the 1920s and 30s in uh, UP towns. Um, but of course, Gurgaon is a completely different place. Um, 1920s, 30s, Kanpur, Lucknow and so on are quite different from Gurgaon today. Um, and one of the key things that seems to me to be critical here is the presence of the private corporate sector, not just the public-private uh, distinction between, uh, you know, as you said, the Nehruvian state and, um, and then, you know, these private uh, enclaves being created in a different way. And the reason I'm saying this is because m m many of the things that you were describing, the controversies over mosques, the, the assumed legitimacy of Hindu processions and so on, uh, were already happening in the 20s and 30s in the context of a colonial, overbearing colonial state. But uh, in the 20s and 30s, you also have um, uh, Indian, uh, elected Indian uh, members of municipal councils who are taking over control of the city. So you have the colonial state on the one hand, and then these private citizens who are gaining power within the context of the local state. Yeah. And this takes me to your question of the legibility and the legibility of the state. Uh, there were different degrees of legibility there. There's the colonial state controlling processions and policing, and then the uh, uh, local state that's controlling the location of mosques and uh, managing the way um, urban morphology would, should be managed and reconfigured and so on. But now we have the corporate sector playing a much bigger role where illegibility becomes much more important. So these are actually happening outside of those institutional structures. So I just wondered whether you wanted to say something about you know, the specific role of the corporate sector. Um, and you also mentioned in the Rahagiri case, uh, all these corporate entities that are sponsoring it, uh, including media houses and uh, uh, various other companies. So I just wondered um, it, about the centrality uh, of this. And I, I was also very uh, struck by the overlap of uh, class and religion um, and I'm not sure how to phrase this question. I mean, you know, of course we know about intersectionality, but here class seems to be expressed through religion, not as two sets of intersecting ideas, but class being uh, articulated through religion. I'm not putting this very well, but you know, religion being absolutely central, um, an absolutely central affect, if you like, of class. It's not just two different identities overlapping. It's, it's integral to the constitution of class. And I just wondered whether you uh, want to um, 
comment on those, but we also have questions. I don't know whether you want to take those. Or... Let me just, I'll just quickly comment on uh, the, which I think that's important, the private capital. I think, I think what is increasingly happening in many Indian cities is the private capital, that the, that the distinction between uh, something called a civil society, uh, private capital in the state, I think has largely collapsed because private capital has now increasingly created its own civil system. What's happened in places like Gurgaon that many of the resident development associations, in fact, the most prominent ones, actually floated by large scale real estate companies. So how do we then distinguish between the role of political science distinction between civil society here, private capital here, and the state there? And that's fundamental. In fact, the most significant resident development association has its offices, you know, in, in, in the office of the largest real estate company in Gurgaon. And it's in fact run by that, that particular company. And that's significant, I think, for us to think about the nature of the state, uh, what, how, what happens to these kind of distinctions that we used to have. Because the state itself has become largely corporatized, not in terms of its efficiency necessarily, but its relationship with private capital. And this, and for me, this is almost fundamental for the, the breakdown, it seems to me, of those categories that we've grown up with intellectually. Uh, if, if private capital produces its own civil society, as it were, how do we think about what happens in cities now? How do we think about ideas of opposing certain things that capital might do or the state might do? Who does? And how do we distinguish these acts, acts of opposition? Are they acts of uh, are they actually acts of opposition? And that's fundamental. I think that's a big difference historically, uh, I think. Because I think at an earlier point in the history, there was a much stronger belief that there was going to be a state. And you believed in the state, you know, a national state whether it was good or bad. And you were, you were moving towards that. I think that idea, I mean, that's, it's an obvious a truism almost, that our dead idea has kind of collapsed. But I think it's much more significant that not only has that idea collapsed, but capital produces, in fact, its own civil society, its own, in a sense, uh, what was meant to be an interrogative aspect of social, social context. Um, and yes, I think there's a big overlap between religion and class. And I can come back to that. But I think that is the most, I, I would say that's the most significant thing. Uh, should, we, I don't, should I read the other stuff? Your questions or? yourself. Do you want to choose the ones you want to answer? So one is says, are there regional differences in the phenomenon you describe, Mumbai versus Chennai? Um, I, th I think so. I think that's a very quick question, a question actually. Someone has asked me this uh, earlier. I think um, in places like uh, certain areas of, of uh, 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 in uh, North India, I don't think there has been, uh, historians will know much better than I do, there hasn't been a similar sense of civic activism in many areas of North India, as there has been, for example, in Tamil Nadu. Um, whether it is, whether it is you know, um, uh, anti upper caste movements that involve large sections of the population, different sections of the population. And I think that um, what has happened most significantly in North India is the Resident Welfare Association, Association, rather the middle class emerging as an actor on its own behalf. Historically, the middle class in India has been an actor not on its own behalf, even implicit they might have been, but it never argued for being an actor on its own behalf. And I think that might be a big regional difference. Although I know in Bangalore, this has been happening, that middle class, um, uh, 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 you know, like Bangalore um, Task Force, for example, like the middle class association acting on its own behalf, um, but nevertheless engaging with what it saw was larger sections of population. I think what's what may be more true in North India is the emergence of a middle class activism because it has no, almost no anchor in history that other parts of India, West India has, South India has, that it's a middle class activism that is almost now entirely on the behalf of middle class. In fact, you know, as people have written that the most, the largest number of PIOs to remove slums from cities are filed by residential associations. So, and I think that that may be a regional difference. I think in other parts of India, Perhaps that aspect hasn't yet come through because many associational activities have a different historical historical trajectory. That's what, that's about as much I can say. I think, uh, Nikita, um, how this uh, how this ordinary person reacts when the women of Shaheen Bagh or farmers take over the streets explains the irritation, the inconvenience to car commuters, metro passengers. Um, here the question would be, uh, what are the uh, sorry? What are the discourses and processes that push out the ordinariness of the Kisan if she or he takes to the streets in the majoritarian, majoritarianism would be one, I suppose, versus Khalistan. Yeah, well, I mean, and I, I think that's, I mean, you know, that, that is something I was trying to get at is the, 
a lot of social science literature, you know, uh, around the world, there is an emphasis on, on why we should look at the uh, ideas of ordinariness. I'm increasingly concerned the Indian context is very risky to look at ideas of ordinariness precisely because it has been so strongly appropriated through certain, by certain structures of power. And you're exactly right in the sense that so Shaheen Bagh, I think, becomes identified, although, you know, in, in many sort of descriptive, anthropological, historical terms, you would identify those women as, as ordinary women. But increasingly, that has become identified as not ordinary because of certain sets of reasons. Um, that the ordinary person is actually the person in the raggedy, uh, in the raggedy context, someone who is involved in appropriating the street in specific ways. Whereas the appropriation of the street and what's happening in Shaheen, what happened in Shaheen Bagh is, and that's a very good example. And if I had sort of a longer paper to present, that's something I, that's the counterpoint I would have, I would present to Shaheen Bagh versus raggedy the two types of ordinariness and how one type of ordinariness has become defined uh, through public discourse as a genuine kind of ordinariness. How do you see next? How do you see entangled urbanism getting un untangled due to state plan rehabilitation of slums? Example, in Delhi, Supreme Court's directive to remove slums from railway areas. Do you expect attainments of higher or lower entangled status? Well, I don't think, I mean, you know, I, I mean entangled in the sense that um, that um, it, th these are not splintered sites. It's something that happens, uh, slum removals happen, for example, you know, there's a very big slum, which is where now the Commonwealth Games site, the, the first world Commonwealth game site was, where, and that slum was removed somewhere else. Um, so the removal of the slum is always entangled with other processes within the city, right? It's not, it's, I mean, I, that's why I don't particularly subscribe to the idea of splintering in urban dimension because um, it doesn't allow us to see the city in its entirety. Um, so, I mean, I, so, so for me, all urban processes are fundamentally entangled. I mean, it's not possible to look at the urban. It's not possible to understand why something happens to one part of the city without understanding uh, or happens to one class to the city of the city without understanding how another class interest is, 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 is involved in it. So I would argue for a constant understanding of the city as constantly enmeshed, and at least the Indian one, never really separated or splintered. Uh, Maheshwar uh, Satpati, I'm aware of the constant tension between religious identities, populist politics, centered around legitimis, legitimization of certain religiosities, and your observations in this regard are remarkable. I'm particularly interested to know how would the Muslim people's negotiations to navigate be perceived and act, acted upon by the opponents who seek to delay de delegitimize it. I'm not, an, not as auditorial as you, but to put it simply and plainly, how do the urban Hindus Gurgaon react to the assertions? I think exactly in the way, but perhaps in the way that I've tried to discuss it, as the assertion of an urban irrationality that must be confined to the home. But of course, most Muslim practices about collective worship. So if you're really interested in a diverse urban sphere, you have to think about what are the different kinds of demands upon, upon, the, upon the public that different populations of that sphere make. And that is what makes a complex city. I mean, that's what a complex city it cannot be produced through, as I've tried to suggest, through um, uh, mis, uh, what's the word, um, mistaking or sort of misrepresenting um, uh, a, 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 a particular point of view as the point, as, as diversity, which, which is, which is, so in fact, I think the reaction to the Gurgaon are mostly around the irrational, irrationality of those who want to practice in the urban sphere. And I've, it's been argued often enough, in fact, that Kamori has also practiced upon urban sphere historically, but they are often, they are usually seen as rational subaltern people, whereas other kinds of people are seen as irrational subaltern people who have the capacity to subvert urban spheres. And that's a very common reaction. And that also has to do with the manner in which Gurgaon has developed as fundamentally focused on private space uh, and then aesthetics of privacy, aesthetics of security, for example, and these other, other kinds of things. Uh, uh, Pratim Ghoshal says, in the case of Gurgaon, I presume there was an older landed local elite who have transformed into key consultants of the new unurbanized elites. How do we see their role and their negotiations in their new urbanism? And that's an interesting question. In fact, Nandini and I have a project together that we are working on. In fact, um, a lot of the older elites have, in fact, sold their lands to um, to the large companies and have become 
millionaires by global standards in the space of 10, 20 years, right? Um, they have, um, so their relationship with the new urban elites who have come to Gurgaon from elsewhere is quite interesting because they would, they are increasingly sending their children to universities, private universities, but often some of the children are, become, are going joining the army and the navy as officers, for example. Uh, and you would argue that they are start, try, starting to appropriate some kind of um, cultural capital. What they share with the urban elite um, is, I think, a deep hostility um, to what I've just described. Um, in fact, many of the older landed elite have, um, as, I mean, not unsurprisingly, have become uh, uh, members of the ruling party or fighting elections. Um, and I think, and as some others have described, what has happened in many such uh, rural areas that, that, that are near cities in India is the rise of a rural middle class, which is a very interesting phenomenon because it also feeds into a certain kind of political mobilization that is now happening. The rise of a rural middle class, the rise of a rural jat, uh, as you should see the rise of a uh, rural Gujar middle class, for example, that's happening, which has its own, uh, which has interesting dimensions and in things to tell us about the relationship between uh, the, uh, the rural older uh, land landlords and their relationship, the religiosity, religiosity and new forms of urbanism and their relationship with the new migrants and new uh, white color professionals that have come into Gurgaon. It's a very complex, a very important question, but I think a very complex question. Could you please go into more detail and compare contrast Bangalore and Gurgaon? Um, in this, in this, in the time that I have here, I probably can't. Um, I think there are great similarities, but again, I, I would still argue as the first person who asked the question for regional differences. And, and to be quite honest, I, I, mean, I it's not a talk. I mean, I've read quite a bit on Gurgaon, on Bangalore. And in the space and time that I have, I probably won't be able to go into it. Except that you have to understand that uh, um, Gurgaon is greenfields development. It is. It was completely village lands. So uh, the new people who, who, who are there are dealing with a number of migrant labor that's come from out of the country, older landed elites that continue to exist and have become very rich. Um, so there are all kinds of cultural dynamics. Um, and also, the, I think the middle class that lives in Gurgaon does not have the same history of civic activism that I think the Bangalore middle class has. Uh, again, it's very difficult for me to go into the minutiae of what I'm trying to say, but that's these are some of the things I think we need to keep in mind. Uh, okay, so uh, Steve, uh, Steve Patik, I think is, uh, it was striking that the construction of these new public spaces does not include mention of education or universities. Do the several large universities in Gurgaon play any part in these public spaces? Or is, is there an absence or is there absence an interesting and distinctive aspect of the strong and exclusive relationship between private capital, state, and middle classes? That's uh, that's very interesting. I mean, in fact, Gurgaon does have um, uh, private universities, but um, my sense is that uh, the 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 prime um, clientele is actually not the Gurgaon uh, middle classes. It is actually uh, the people who've been there for a long time who now want to send their kids to to universities. Because um, a lot of the universities actually don't have I mean, the majority. They have things like uh, urban planning and architecture, but they're largely focused on technical subjects. Um, not, I mean, like who, uh, not, not, not sociology and anthropology. Um, they, uh, they, 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 they do play a, play a part in these public spaces. Um, in fact, Gurgaon is a hub, not so much for private universities, but extraordinary number of private schools. And that is a significant, really interesting aspect. Uh, um, uh, and most of the public schools, many of the private schools are of course run by large corporations and several of them are owned by um, large real estate companies. Once again, this is a really interesting question about the relationship between private capital, education institutions, and the nature of public and private spaces in Gurgaon and the new middle class that are emerging. Um, I can't really say much more than that, except that, uh, ex except that the conversion of um, uh, the different forms of private capital into educational capital is also the site of the production of kind of cultural capital that different, uh, different classes in Gurgaon are now taking part in, including the older landed elite uh, who sort of sold their land and become very rich uh, uh, um, and, and, and now want to send their children to private universities. So most of the kids go to private universities in Gurgaon and in fact in Noida, in places like Noida. Um, and, and, and now increasingly to many, many private schools that exist in Gurudam. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, 
Amur Sharma, to what extent do caste fault lines within urban centers like Gurgaon fracture the project of creating the singular Hindu public? For example, despite state patronage for Kamar, uh, Kanwar, Kamar Yatra, most upper caste, upper class residents of Gurgaon still, see, see, still tend to see the Yatra as a public nuisance. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's interesting. I think but what has happened increasingly is that um, at least uh, the, um, uh, in the broader uh, urban uh, Rural or urban context, um, um, because in fact, yeah, I mean, I've worked it's like, uh, in fact, at, at a particular uh, camp, which was run by Dalits, and there are many such many uh, many uh, many uh, many such camps that are run by different caste organizations um, that tend to, in fact, to subscribing to an overarching Hinduism. On the one hand, tend to kind of level the uh, level off or sort of efface the notion of Dalit and non-Dalit. I think you're right that um, many people in uh, certainly the upper caste uh, in the living communities in Europe, tend to see the Kamar Yatras as, as, a, as a nuisance, as a public nuisance, but not, I must emphasize, as, as a public nuisance of the same degree of nuisance value, as, uh, if you like, as the namaz in public spaces. The discourse is very different because the Kamar Yatras are very well organized. There's police prisons, there are encampments, there are fans, there is a spraying, there's fabulous food, there's massive um, kitchens, etc., etc. So it's actually run on very, very uh, organized corporate lines. So that while it, it was early, actually, uh, you know, it was much more disruptive of transport, but it is extraordinarily well organized. The large numbers of police are, police are dedicated to it. Whereas the Namaz activity uh, is not for, for different kinds of reasons, because it is at the heart of a series of hostile relationships between different groups and a continuing hostility between the state and the private capital on one hand and, and, and Muslims on the other hand. So I think you're right that yes, they are seen, uh, Kamar Yatra is seen as a nuisance, but I think we know to also need to think about um, uh, 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 the nature of the nuisance and how do you understand how upper caste Hindus might view the idea of a public nuisance that comes from Hindus as the public nuisance and the real threat that is seen to come from Muslims who are seen as fundamentally um, uh, people who are not, who are, who are, who are, who are, the, who are antithetical to the making of, uh, of decent public spaces. I think, I think I've covered everything. There's one no, Sorry, Romit, sorry, one more question. Might it be useful, Romit Chaudhary says, uh, it also relate to your idea, it's related to your idea of the ordinary person to the, to the turn to ordinary cities in post-colonial urban literature. What conceptual work does the category of the ordinary perform in these two contexts? Yeah. I think the ordinary city framework is, I think is, I mean, at least I would argue slightly different because it, it posits a sense of um, ordinariness, if you like, and put in inverted commas in the Indian, in a progressive manner, that, that ordinariness is something to be thought of as a good thing, if you like. I am suggesting here that the idea of ordinariness must be local, localized. There is no global ordinary that, 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 that we should be thinking about. That the idea of ordinariness in the Indian context uh, is, is something quite different as connected to the ordinary cities framework, which is very much about how to see, think cities in their specific context. So while there are some overlaps, I would nevertheless argue, I would always put ordinary in my usage within scare quotes, within inverted commas, in order to suggest that what I'm talking about is the appropriation of the idea of the ordinary within certain structures, structures of, uh, of power, which is a result of changing relationship between the state, private capital, and uh, the middle class citizen. So I would, I would look at ordinariness, um, uh, uh, there are overlaps, but I think in, in, in a slightly different manner. But I think it's a productive relationship, certainly between the two as to how do we localize ordinariness? Just as I would argue that, for example, that I would, in my, in the present, I would never use the term neoliberal, for example. But I think we need to understand the local histories of capital. I know the people here, for example, Nikita has written on real estate in different parts of the country. And looking at the local history of real estate as she's looked at is really interesting because the idea of a global neoliberal world tells me nothing about how capital operates in Burgaon, which is very different to how it might operate in, I don't know, in some other, city in the world. Capital in Gurgaon, uh, you know, relates quite well to certain ideas of class, certain ideas of caste, certain ideas of religion. 
So it's only to suggest that we need to localize some of this context in order not to have some kind of Indian exceptionalism, but precisely to link how local, local capital operates to its global form, global incarnations. Okay, well, I think we've um, covered all the questions and uh, uh, clearly the, uh, the lecture was uh, brilliant as some people have commented as a result of which we've had uh, such a lot of questions and thank you Sanjay for answering those. Uh, we have managed to go over the one hour uh, uh, designated time. So um, I'm afraid time for us to uh, bring this to a close. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Sanjay, for thank such you. a stimulating thank you, all of you. And Thanks, uh, all of you. thank you to uh, the, the audience as well. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Bye-bye.